Okay, sorry I have day two bed head and I'm still in my pajamas while well, I have a robe on. I'm too tired to get myself completely together. I did put half a face on so I don't come here looking completely a whole mess, but let's continue with the clownathon. Today I watched 100 Tears, which is about a clown killing people with a giant meat cleaver, mostly. There's also a side story about two reporters who usually work in the tabloid news, but one convinces the other that they should get into investigative journalism and look into serial killers. You can see where those two stories connect. This looks like it's an independent film done on a micro budget. Um, unfortunately, it employs those filters that I don't like and the lighting is really, I don't wanna say bad, I'll just say it's not to my liking. The score was surprisingly good, I have to mention that. The only issue I had was there were times where some of the dialogue was too low and then the score would come in too loud so I had to keep turning the volume up and down. When characters are talking, I'm turning it up. When the score is too loud, I'm turning it down. So that is one thing that they could have adjusted better, but the score itself was really good. The gore was really good in this. I really appreciated the color of the blood, which is one of my pet peeves is when the color of the blood is too bright orangey, too dark, or when they use CGI blood. It was a little watery. I'm thinking because they had a micro budget, they probably added some water so that they can stretch out the amount of blood that they had because there's a lot of blood used in this movie but i like the old gooey corn syrup type of blood if you haven't already guessed i love gore do you remember gore zone magazine or fangoria well fangoria i think is still in production although i think they're they might not be in production soon but back in the day, I used to get Gorezone and Fangoria magazines, and I had really great full color posters in my room until my mother took them down because she said they were disgusting. And sometimes I think about how much those would be worth on eBay nowadays. Some of the dialogue was pretty snappy. Like there's one point where the girl says, he's not a crackhead, he's just misunderstood. Now, remember when I said that this was a micro budget movie and some of the acting wasn't so great, or maybe I didn't say the acting was so great. Well, I'm saying the acting isn't so great right now. I do want to make it known that I'm not a movie snob. I do talk about the technical aspects of movies because I find them interesting, but I'm not going to crap all over a movie if the technical aspects are not so great, if the story is good. Well, one thing that I think really saves very low budget movies, uh, well, low budget horror in particular, is if you include either really snappy dialogue, even if the acting isn't great, you can still be entertained by what the actors are saying, some type of sexuality or and or, no, not and or, and lots and lots of gore. This movie had lots and lots of gore. Decapitations, dismemberments. Oh, respect to the person who did the limbs and the intestines, very good work. At this point in time, the power went off for an hour, so I had to stop watching the movie and then come back to it. Um, for those of you that don't know, I am in Florida and we were without power for four days last week. And then today, I guess the election company was working on something, so they shut the power off again for an hour. Now that we're back into the movie, they introduce a character who is more like Harley Quinn than the Harley Quinn that was in Suicide Squad. She even had at one point a large sledgehammer and it kind of reminded me of Harley Quinn's mallet. The ending in the warehouse was really tedious. I felt like it went on for way too long and not enough was happening for me to be engaged. It felt like it was stretched out for time's sake and I don't think that was necessary because this movie was an hour and 30 minutes. It could have really been whittled down to maybe 75 minutes just so that the pacing could be snappier. The final scene was really good and like I said they could have cut out most of the warehouse scene because it just it kind of dragged for me take that with a grain of salt though because i watched this on one of the channels that has commercial interruptions it may be that the scene felt more dragged out because it had to keep stopping and going to commercial so maybe a scene that was only seven or eight minutes long felt like 18 minutes to me because it was four minutes and then commercials then another four minutes and then commercials and you know so on and so forth. I gave this a 5.5 out of 10 for enjoyment. That may seem low, but it's because I actually really enjoyed the gore, but the acting left a lot to be desired, the pacing like I explained earlier, and after a while, the lighting was really a put off to me. Dear filmmakers, there are these people that actually do lighting for a living. I think it's a really good idea to employ them, and I feel like some lower budget filmmakers skimp on this because they think oh it's only lighting we can do it ourselves they go and they make sure they get someone who can do special effects and they go and make sure they can they get someone that can do editing but with the lighting i feel like they think that anyone can light something and just do it themselves and they don't understand that there actually is an art to lighting things and that there are people who are very good at this art hire them pay them well it will make a huge difference in how your movie is received it could be that 
you were purposely going for this type of aesthetic and it just didn't sit well with me it just didn't it just didn't appeal to me but that's just my two cents also take some time to add some trivia to your imdb or movie chat page because a lot of us are watching your movies on streaming services and there's no DVD extra. So if there's things that you feel like would add to the watcher's enjoyment of your movie, some type of trivia, some type of behind the scenes information, put that on your page. It's kind of disheartening when we go to see your pages and there's like no trivia available. There's gotta be at least one interesting story of something that happened while you were making this film. Share it with us. By the way, I originally was gonna score this a five out of 10 and I ended up making it 5.5 out of 10 because they actually added an after credit scene and I thought that was pretty cool. If you like gore, dismemberment, decapitations, definitely check this movie out because they gave it to you. Next up, I'm going to watch Amusement and I'll let you know what I think about that. Okay, so I just finished watching Amusement. This is a movie about, well, this movie was advertised as it being about killer clown who's stalking three women due to a grudge that he's holding against them about something that they did to him in their childhood. I like how the opening credits of the movie give us some backstory just visually. We see the girls' high school pictures and their senior superlatives. If you're outside the United States, a senior superlative is when at the end of the year, seniors vote each other best dressed or smartest in the class, most artistic or most likely to. Then in addition to the, the superlatives, we also see notes about another student having psychological issues, being declared psychotic and recommendations for them to be housed in a inpatient psychiatric facility. That falls into that movie rule show don't tell then we get right into the action and i really like the pacing when the movie starts it starts off with a bang it just starts going and it's hitting you with things hitting with things i'm purposely being vague because i feel like it's better for you to watch this without knowing what's going to happen we meet shelby which is the first of the three young women she's traveling with her boyfriend and some strange things happen when they run into a stranger with a very odd laugh and that's all i'll say about that after that sequence we're introduced to tabitha who ends up having to babysit two children since their babysitter disappeared i think she is their cousin i'm um, not 100 sure so correct me if i'm wrong but i think she is their cousin she's babysitting them by the way when we're introduced to these different characters their name actually pops up on screen and i quite like that at first i was a little disappointed by this premise because i'm getting kind of tired of the babysitter in danger trope <sighs> i feel like it's so overdone and i'm just really bored by it then the sequence ends up being the same story that i've seen done on YouTube short movies, which may have actually started as a creepypasta. However, despite me being a little bit bored by the whole premise of the babysitter in danger, it was very well executed. It was engaging. I wasn't, I actually was not bored by the sequence. I was just a little disappointed at the beginning about what the subject matter of the sequence was going to be. But then seeing an execution, I was like, that wasn't so bad. Then we get a flashback sequence of Tabitha and the other two young ladies when they're in elementary school and they all have these projects that they've done in these boxes and one little boy has one as well and he asked them to look at his and basically they just he asked them if it's funny and they say it's not funny and that's it i mean we as the audience see what's in the boxes but i won't tell you what's in the boxes i'll just tell you that i guess his whole issue was that what he did he thought was funny and they said it wasn't funny which it actually wasn't funny Oh, what he did do, what was in the box, was a really good practical effect, I will say that. Then we meet Lisa, which we actually saw her in the childhood flashback as a child. Now we see her as an adult. She lives with a roommate and she's hanging out with her boyfriend and her roommate doesn't show back up. So then she goes to find out what happened to her roommate. For some reason, this part of the movie is suddenly using some kind of muted color palette or filter. And you know how I feel about that already? It kind of has a sickly green tint to it and I just I don't like it. The locations though were really good. The apartment looked very lived in. Respect to the set decorator or set designer because they really made it look like someone's real apartment and not just a movie set. The hotel looked like one of those places that you go into in a Resident Evil or Silent Hill type video game. Unfortunately this part of the movie really slowed down to a snail's pace. It kind of dragged for a little bit. Then out of nowhere there was a Wilhelm screen and I, I got a kick out of that. I don't know why it was so funny to me, but it was so random. Next, something very interesting happens with some mattresses. I only say that for the people who have watched it, they know what I'm talking about. 
I thought that was actually pretty cool. So despite this segment being kind of slow, the payoff was kind of worth it. Then the story turns back to Tabitha and speeds back up again. Tabitha finds out what happened to Shelby and Lisa and the practical gore effects with that situation was really good as well. At this point, I'm still trying to figure out what the girls did to make him so upset to want to exact revenge because that sequence with them as the children, I didn't think that that was strong enough. I thought that, oh, that was just going to be the beginning and then there was going to be something else they did to him that really, really messed him up. But apparently that's all they did. They just told him that his project wasn't funny. And if that's grounds for revenge, then, I mean, I've been through a hell of a lot worse stuff than that in elementary school and middle school. And if that was grounds for revenge, there should be a whole bunch of dead asses in my wake. So the movie ends, I won't tell you how it ended, but um, I'm kind of disappointed that that's all it was that made him that upset. The movie posits that he was pretty much psychotic already due to what he had in that box. So them laughing at, them, at him, I don't see how that was supposed to set him off even more. It just seemed like it was too minor. I can't help but feel let down because I feel like you should go one of two ways with psychotic killers. One, either make them evil for evil's sake, like Michael Myers. Michael Myers is evil because he just is. Which is the reason why I really can't stand Rob Zombie's Halloween. I mean, I might get off on a little bit of rant here, but the thing that made Michael Myers Michael Myers is the fact that he was evil for evil's sake. This is a kid that comes from a pretty well-to-do, I would say, upper middle class family, two-parent home, nothing in his background that would suggest psychosis. He just one day gets up, decides to start killing people, starting with his sister. That's scary. It's scary because it could be anyone, even his physique. He was a normal sized man. It could be anyone. What does Rob Zombie do? Rob Zombie decides, I'm going to try to explain his psychosis and make him, you know, psychotic because his parents were poor white trash that, let me use it, quotation marks it, because I'm not calling these people this. I'm saying how they're meant to be perceived. And in my opinion, I think this is how they're meant to be perceived, that they're quote, poor white trash and they're abusive. And I feel like in Rob Zombie's Halloween, he has like, well, not just Halloween, but a lot of his movies, he has some kind of weird obsession and fascination with quote, poor white trash. And I feel like if I was poor and white, I would be really offended at his portrayal. His movies make them look like they're all dirty, ugly, and that they only behave in abusive and whorish way. These people do exist, but it's almost like he's romanticizing it. And it, I, I guess I can't get with that. I could continue this tangent about Rob Zombie's Halloween or even get into part two, but I feel like that deserves a whole video of itself about the whole ghost mom and the unicorn crap and making Michael Myers seven feet tall. Like Rob Zombie is a ghost somewhere and make the Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie that he really wants to make. I don't know why they didn't ask him to do it. Obviously that movie has the aesthetic that Rob Zombie loves. Why are you having him do Halloween and not Texas Chainsaw Massacre? If anyone should have done Halloween, I'm thinking maybe Eli Roth, although he might have made it too tongue in cheek because he likes to infuse comedy in things. So maybe he'd be better with a Friday the 13th movie. But anyone except Rob Zombie, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Rob Zombie, I like the House of a Thousand Corpses and I like uh, Witches of Salem. But your other stuff, man, I just can't with the let's, you know, look at dirty, poor people doing nasty shit all the time. I can't. Anyway, as I was saying, you either make the person evil for evil's sake or you give their backstory enough kick to it that you can understand why this person wants revenge. For example, in Slaughter High, the killer was accidentally burned over most of his body by his bullies. And obviously that would make you wanna get revenge on these people. Friday the 13th, Jason drowned to death because the counselors were not paying attention to the children. Again, that's worthy of wanting to get revenge. Freddy Krueger, burned to death. He was accused of killing children. It's never really expressed in the original Nightmare on Elm Street. I did not get the sense of whether he was guilty. Ah, no, I take that back. He was tried and then he got off on a technicality and that's why the parents burned him to death. But still, that's an extreme reason for wanting to get revenge. Candyman, his painting hand was cut off and then he was stung to death by bees. Also, Decent reason for wanting to get revenge. Even a lesser known killer in this movie called Popcorn, he was burned as a child because his parents were in some kind of crazy cult and he was burned over most of his body and I can understand why he wanted to get revenge. You see how these things make sense? Whereas someone saying that your joke isn't funny or your little psychotic box is not funny is worth getting revenge over? No, you need to do more. Even Pumpkinhead. I think the dude's son got killed accidentally and then he summoned the demon Pumpkinhead for revenge. You see how that works? You gotta do something extreme in order for 
the revenge to feel justified. So like I said, pick one, evil for evil's sake or revenge because of a, an extreme wrong done to them. While I'm kvetching, this movie was misadvertised as a killer clown movie. The killer only dons a clown costume for about 10 minutes in the second segment and then the rest of the movie he's himself. So I wouldn't really consider this a killer clown movie. Each of these segments do play out like an anthology type series. I don't know whether that was done purposely or not, but I really dug it. This had, for the most part, a good production value. The lighting was good for the first two segments, the segment with Shelby and the segment with Tabitha. Then the lighting kind of got, I don't know what why they decided to do what they decided to do. The soundtrack was really good, although sometimes it was doing too much where there would be, there would be times when someone was just walking through a house and you get these loud musical cues for something scary happening when actually nothing is happening. When you overuse this, it becomes less impactful and I feel like you really have to learn how to use it sparingly. As the movie progressed though, the soundtrack got a lot better and it wasn't as overused as it was at the very beginning. I'm giving this a five out of 10 for enjoyment. Even though the even though the execution was good and the gore effects were pretty good, I have to take points off for the killer having such a whack-ass reason for wanting revenge. And I'm a little salty about it not truly being a killer clown movie. But as always, don't take my word for it. Check it out for yourself. Just because I love something doesn't mean you won't hate it. And just because I hate something doesn't mean you won't love it. So if you've already seen this movie, let me know in the comments what you thought of it. And I will be continuing the clownathon. Might have to drink might have to drink some Red Bull or something and keep going, but I'm gonna get it done.